Nancy's husband, Patrick, was 15 years her senior. She didn't want to marry him, but her parents insisted. What is a woman's purpose? Nancy's mother, Rebecca, had indoctrinated her since childhood to bear children and obey her husband. Arguing with her mother was futile and only made matters worse, but Nancy tried. What if I don't want to get married? I'm only 15, she protested. Rebecca sighed, I'm not suggesting you should marry now. When you turn 18, your father and I will decide whom you should marry. And what if I don't want to marry at 18? What if I want to study, work, become a programmer, or an architect, or start my own business? Nancy retorted, earning a smack for her audacity. It wasn't particularly painful, but it was hurtful and humiliating. Where did you get such absurd ideas? An architect? Ridiculous. Who would hire a woman? Her mother sternly rebuked her. A woman's place is to keep her home orderly and raise her children. But you work yourself, Nancy countered, fighting back tears. Rebecca sighed again, I only work because there's no place in our village where your father could earn a decent wage. Nancy's father was a school bus driver. Each day, he transported children from neighboring villages to school and back. His job was considered respectable in their community, and his consistent pay was a bonus. However, his salary was insufficient for Nancy's mother to be a stay-at-home mom, so Rebecca worked as a saleswoman in the local store, a job she didn't enjoy. Her moods often reflected her interactions with customers, and since the store was the only one in the village, locals had to tolerate her occasional rudeness. Rebecca's only source of happiness and hope was her daughter. Her dream was to marry her daughter off to a wealthy man, thinking it might benefit her too. Nancy was a beautiful girl with long, thick golden hair and big black eyes framed by fluffy eyelashes. She met her future husband, Patrick, before she turned 18, on the day they met she and her mother were in the city to buy a graduation dress. How quickly you grow up, sighed Rebecca, sorting through the outfits. Though simple, the dresses looked stunning on Nancy and enhanced her natural beauty. Well, you look wonderful. Everything suits your face. You could take all of these outfits, the saleswoman complimented. She was a short, plump woman in her 40s with a ruddy complexion. Obediently, Nancy tried on one outfit after another, twirling in front of the mirror for her mother's approval. She was indifferent about what to wear to the prom. Firstly, her mother would insist on buying what she preferred. Secondly, her parents had rejected her plea to continue her studies. They had already compiled a list of potential suitors and planned to address this matter seriously once Nancy graduated. Prom, a pleasant male voice suddenly sounded near them. Nancy turned around in the light blue knee-length dress she was trying on. She felt subconscious under the stranger's scrutinizing gaze. He was tall and towered over her. His broad shoulders, firm chin, and straight black eyebrows gave him an air of confidence and strength. His black eyes, even darker than Nancy's, bore into her. Nancy also noticed how the saleswoman's demeanor changed when she saw the stranger. She tensed up and started to smile ingratiatingly. Yes, we're going to the prom, Rebecca answered for her daughter. How do you like the dress? Does it suit my daughter? Nancy felt uneasy that her mother was seeking the opinion of a stranger who was unabashedly staring at her. However, the man did not seem surprised by Rebecca's question. He examined Nancy once again from head to toe and shook his head in disapproval. I think we can offer you a better solution, Sarah, come here, he gestured slightly, and a saleswoman immediately approached him. The stranger whispered something to her, and she nodded vigorously. Of course, Mr. Woods, it'll be here in a minute, she said cheerfully, but not naturally. To Nancy, nodding towards the dressing room, Nancy noticed Mr. Woods and her mother watching her expectantly too. It seemed she had no other choice. Upon seeing the dress, Nancy immediately realized that it was far superior to the one she had tried on earlier. The fabric, tailoring, even the smell suggested it was at least ten times more expensive. As Nancy stepped out of the dressing room, she heard her mother gasp in delight. Yes, the dress was a dream made of smooth red silk. 
It fitted snugly and fell almost to the floor, flaring out like a blooming flower. The narrow straps accentuated the girl's shoulders and collar bones without being provocative. Nancy thought any movie star or royalty would be proud to wear such a dress. The slit to mid thigh showcased her long, slender legs, but could easily be concealed within the numerous fabric folds if needed. This must be worth as much as my parents earn in two months, Nancy thought, slowly turning in front of the mirror. She was caught between admiration for her beauty and youth, the realization that this dress was perfect for her, and an unexplainable fear. How much is it? Rebecca asked. She seemed to understand that this was not an ordinary dress. Sarah was about to answer, but Mr. Wood stopped her with a hand gesture. It's a gift, he replied, provided you invite me to the prom. Oh, of course, of course, Rebecca replied hastily, seemingly in disbelief. The man nodded, seemingly confident in her response. He then turned to the saleswoman, Sarah, let's pick out some shoes. The saleswoman quickly produced a white rectangular box containing black sandals with a low heel and elegantly intertwined straps. Mr. Woods took the shoes from her and approached Nancy. May I? he asked, looking at her from head to toe. Nancy nodded, her head spinning. He squatted in front of her, maintaining an air of majesty and masculinity, and slowly replaced Nancy's old, worn ballet shoes with the black sandals. What a beauty, Rebecca exclaimed, mesmerized. Of course, these are a gift too, Mr. Woods added. Fifteen minutes later, Nancy emerged from the store, clutching two large bags containing a dress and shoes. Her mother and Mr. Woods remained inside, discussing the details of her upcoming graduation party. I've just been sold, Nancy thought to herself. I've really been sold. She was terrified that Mr. Woods might show up at their house soon, perhaps even before the graduation party, but fortunately, he didn't. Nancy tried to convince herself that it was all just a bad dream or, at the very least, a gift from a stranger that she wouldn't owe anything for, but every time she looked at the dress hanging next to her bed, she realized that no one would give me to marry him. Nancy said bluntly. Maybe I do, her mother said bluntly. What's wrong with that? He's handsome, respected, wealthy, and the only one truly deserving of you, mom, Nancy cried out in despair. I don't even know him, Rebecca slammed her fist on the table. Enough with your hysteria, she shouted at her daughter. I didn't know your father when I married him either, and look at us. We've been together for years. You're such a beauty, yet you're being picky. Tears streamed down Nancy's face. I don't want to get married, she whispered desperately. Suddenly, Rebecca decided to change tactics. She gently embraced her daughter and awkwardly stroked her blonde hair. I'm not suggesting you rush to the registry office with him tomorrow, Rebecca said. Just give him a chance. Get to know him better, chat with him. After graduation, you might fall in love with him. And if he turns out to be a bad man, we won't let him have you. Nancy sobbed. She wasn't sure whether she could completely trust her mother, but her words were soothing. Eventually, the long-awaited graduation day arrived at their small school. The celebration was modest compared to those in the city. They gathered in the assembly hall, where all the graduates, numbering more than three dozen, were brought onto the stage. Then began a series of congratulatory speeches from the principal, teachers, and parents committee. The graduates smiled awkwardly, shifting from foot to foot. The boys were uncomfortable in their new shoes, while the girls struggled to stand in high heels. Nancy's dress and shoes were the center of attention. All the girls had tried their best for this day, but her outfit stood out. The girls looked at Nancy with envy and admiration, while the boys looked on with adoration and a sense of her being unattainable. It was clear that a simple country boy could not win over a girl in such a dress. The formal part of the ceremony concluded, and the graduates descended from the stage to join their tearful families for photos. Nancy approached her family, tearful grandparents embraced their granddaughter, remarking on her beauty and wishing her happiness. Her father kissed her cheek, hugged her, and murmured something. The girl had only one look at her mother to realize how she was burning with impatience. Nancy's heart trembled, something is about to happen, she thought with a sense of dread. 
Congratulations, a voice sounded behind her. She recognized it instantly, even though she had only heard it once before. Nancy turned around. Patrick Woods stood before her in a flawless black suit and a snow-white shirt, offering her a bouquet of white lilies. It felt as if everyone in the room was looking at her. Thank you, she responded, accepting the bouquet. You look absolutely stunning, Patrick complimented. Thank you, all thanks to your dress and shoes, her mother interjected. They only emphasized what was already flawless, Patrick replied. All this time he did not take his eyes off Nancy. She was scared, yet a new feeling of excitement and pride emerged. He chose her from everyone else, and now everyone was looking at her, standing in the most beautiful dress in the world. Patrick and Nancy's wedding took place on the last day of summer. Patrick covered all the expenses. The celebration was held in a luxurious restaurant, likely the biggest in the city. Nancy was awed by its beauty and grandeur. Her parents stood by, stunned. Rebecca looked around the luxurious hall, seemingly unable to believe what she was seeing. Nancy sat next to her husband, trying to understand her feelings. Everything had happened too quickly. Just a few hours ago, she had met Patrick's relatives. All the men in his family resembled him, tall, sturdy, with black eyes and dark hair. The women were alike, only more graceful. It struck her that Patrick's family wasn't surprised by the quick wedding, nor were they bothered by not knowing the bride. Nancy sat in her stunning white lace dress, afraid to move. Everyone came up to them, saying congratulations and wishing happiness and prosperity. Nancy smiled, accepted their good wishes, and felt like a beautifully adorned doll or puppet placed here to fulfill a role, the role of a beautiful bride, the role of a young wife. She was a girl who could be dressed up in an expensive, luxurious wedding dress and shown off to everyone. But what is she like? Who is she? No one had asked her this question, not even Patrick. He seemed to have simply bought her from his parents. He saw her and claimed her as one might a coveted item in a shop window. Nancy then realized that she didn't even know what kind of man her husband was. Yes, he had a certain intimidating allure. She noticed how other women gazed at him with awe and admiration, even during their wedding, their eyes filled with envy. Nancy understood that he was a catch in every sense, handsome, strong, intelligent, wealthy. But these were just qualities listed off. She didn't know who the man behind these words truly was. Patrick took her to his apartment, which was nothing like the small village house Nancy had lived in all her life. Everything in this new home frightened her. She was scared to touch anything, fearing she might break something. She suddenly felt like a terrified little girl, which in reality she was. A week later, her husband said, Stop behaving like a guest in this house. You are the mistress here, and everything here will be as you wish. After these words, Nancy felt better. She had learned how to cook and clean, and she had now begun to use these skills. She didn't have much else to do as she was just a wife and a homemaker. Nancy had no friends in the city, her parents were far away, and she didn't even apply to college. She once thought while standing near the stove and stirring a pot of stew, is this really the life my mother imagined for me? Will my life only consist of these days, weeks, and months? Past and nothing in Nancy's life changed. She settled more comfortably into the house and managed her duties as a homemaker and young wife more effectively. But she was very lonely, despite frequently having guests, her husband Patrick's business associates, his parents, and his older brother. Her parents also visited every few months. Rebecca thoroughly enjoyed every minute spent in her son-in-law's apartment. She never tired of telling her husband, look at this beauty, our daughter is so lucky. Nancy's father used to nod silently. Unlike her mother, he didn't express pleasure or dissatisfaction, but simply took everything as a given. Nancy also suspected that Patrick was giving her mother money and likely a significant sum, as Rebecca left looking even happier than the day she had arrived to her daughter. At times, Nancy would wonder why Patrick had married her. He had made this decision after their first meeting, before he even had time to get to know her. He didn't spend much time with her, and although she wanted to confront him about it, something always stopped her. 
Patrick didn't show her any kind of passion or lofty love, at least not like the kind Nancy had seen in movies or read about in books. In fact, it seemed he viewed her as a functional unit, a high-quality item that he needed to maintain his status. At first, Nancy didn't fully understand his business. Later, she realized that the shopping center where they met was owned by Patrick, or rather, it had been owned by his father before he transferred it to his son. Patrick occasionally mentioned a machine shop, cafe, pawn shop, and funeral parlor, all seemingly owned by him and his family. Being such a successful businessman, Patrick needed to live up to his status. He had a nice car, watch, shoes, phone, and now he got a wife who was young, beautiful, economical, and intelligent enough to accompany him to business meetings. Two years after their wedding, Patrick announced, we'll be moving to a new house soon. A new house? Where? Nancy asked, surprised. Not far, in the next city, more specifically, outside of it, Patrick replied. But why should we move? Why not? My business is expanding, and it'll be more convenient to manage it from there. And by the way, there shouldn't be any problem for you, since you're at home most of the time. That's what I wanted to discuss with you, Nancy interjected. Don't worry, you'll have plenty to do there. It's a large house that needs fixing up. Besides, Patrick added, hugging her and kissing her cheek, it's time to think about having children. But I'm only 20, Nancy countered. So what? We've been married for two years already. My mom gave birth at 19. I don't even have an education, Patrick smiled. And why do you need it? What do you mean, the husband sighed? Nancy, people get an education to get a job. You don't need to work. She looked embarrassed. But that's not. Maybe later, I'll want to work. Patrick laughed. He sat down on the sofa and drew his wife to him. Sweetheart, what are you talking about? You've been living a dream for two years, a life that all women wish for. We're about to move to a new house, and then you'll have a child, and you will raise him or her. Nancy realized her husband had a point. Should she complain? Did any of her classmates live in such a house? Most of them remained in the village, destined to spend their lives there. They would marry classmates who might eventually become abusive husbands. Those who managed to escape the village now live in dormitories, working tirelessly to support themselves in the city. They'll likely do that for the rest of their lives. Of course, you're right, replied Nancy, but I'd like to do something else besides stay at home. Don't I forbid you? Once we move, you can do whatever you want, okay, replied Nancy, suddenly realizing that she didn't know what she wanted to do. The issue was resolved after the couple moved to a new house. The neighboring city was further than Nancy had anticipated, and the house was not in the city but in a settlement an hour's drive away. Public transportation was almost impossible to use. Nancy didn't know how to drive, so when her husband was away, she was virtually confined to her new home. Besides, Nancy and Patrick seldom ventured into the city, only for occasional meetings with his partners. Nancy devoted all her spare time to organizing the new house, with Patrick providing unlimited funds. Order anything you want on the internet, he said. They'll deliver everything. So Nancy spent her days choosing finishes, furniture, chandeliers, wallpaper, and so on, although she knew little about it. She seemed to manage quite well. You have excellent taste, Patrick told her once, seeing the results of her work. Thank you. Yes, the house is transformed, he said, approaching his wife and giving her a kiss. You're a natural wife and hostess. All that's left is to become a mother. However, it took another two years before Nancy became pregnant. She couldn't believe her eyes when she saw the two stripes. It felt as if life split into before and after. She wouldn't be alone anymore. There would now be someone in the house who would always be with her, someone to lighten her loneliness, because Nancy felt very lonely. She had been married for four years, yet she still couldn't understand her husband, especially lately. Patrick always seemed to be busy. Nancy understood that her husband's work was his top priority, but she yearned for him to spend time with her, which hardly happened. She hoped the child would fill this void. 
As for Patrick, he was thrilled when he found out about the pregnancy. Finally, he exclaimed, I'm going to have a son. What if it's a girl? No, it has to be a boy, my heir. However, they ended up having a daughter, Bonnie. Patrick was happy, but Nancy could tell that he would have been even more excited if he had had a son. After Bonnie's birth, Patrick's life remained mostly unchanged. He still spent most of his time at work, while Nancy was left to care for their daughter, always worried she might do something wrong and feel utterly exhausted. Things became slightly easier when her parents came to stay for a few weeks. She hadn't seen them for over a year and was thrilled when they had visited her. My girl, how you've grown, exclaimed Rebecca. And what a wonderful house you have. Her father approached Nancy, giving her a hug and a kiss. And who is this little one we have here? Rebecca asked gently, looking at Bonnie lying in the cradle. She looks a lot like you, added the grandfather. Nancy felt more at ease with her parents around, less lonely, although she didn't dare to express her true feelings because she didn't want to dampen their happiness. Rebecca was thrilled when she learned that her daughter had furnished the house. You're very talented, my girl, she said. It's very cozy and beautiful here. Simply fabulous, Dad added. How wonderful that you live in such a beautiful place. You're lucky to have such a good husband, Rebecca sighed. Nancy nodded. That's true, but sometimes I feel lonely here. You're not alone now, her mother replied. Believe me, you can't get bored with a small child. And if you do, you can always have another one. And a third, the father joyfully added, and they all laughed. A cold chill ran down Nancy's spine. She loved Bonnie more than life itself and had accepted her fate next to Patrick. But was she destined to only be a wife and mother, trapped in this beautiful house? What would become of her once the children grew up and left? Patrick would still be a businessman, the head of the family, and she just an empty shell. A few days after celebrating Bonnie's second birthday, Patrick announced, By the way, soon you and your daughter will have some company. Nancy and Bonnie were sitting on a mat, with Bonnie playing with cubes, stacking them on top of one another. What kind of company? Nancy asked. My good friend bought a house in the neighborhood, and will be moving here with his wife and child in a week, Patrick replied. That sounds great, exclaimed Nancy. It's about time our daughter met other kids. They have a son the same age as Bonnie, Patrick added, with a change in his voice tone. Nancy squirmed, aware that Patrick wanted a son. He had often suggested having another child, but she wasn't ready yet. The only thing constraining Patrick was a doctor's advice recommending Nancy to wait a few more years before having another child. Are they visiting us? Nancy asked. No, they invited us to their housewarming party, Patrick responded. On the designated day and at the exact time, their family was already at the neighboring house. Nancy noticed that their neighbor's house was as large as theirs. A smiling woman in a shiny evening dress opened the door. Seeing her, Nancy regretted her simple attire of black jeans and a white t-shirt, having thought it was just a casual visit to the neighbors, not a social gathering. Hello, the young landlady shouted cheerfully. Come on in. She appeared to be a little older than Nancy, slender, tall, with long red hair and blue eyes. It seemed she was more comfortable in public than at home. However, Nancy hoped they could still be friends. The house was large, spacious, and luxuriously furnished, a little too much for Nancy's taste. My husband will be here soon, then she slapped her forehead with her palm. I'm so absent-minded. I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Joyce. Nancy nodded and smiled. Nancy, nice to meet you. And this must be Bonnie, yes? Nancy replied. Yes, Nancy replied. My son Tony is over there, Joyce pointed towards the back of the room. Nancy brought Bonnie to the boy and made sure that they got along, looking at each other with smiles. At that moment, Joyce's husband Brian entered the living room. One look at him was enough for Nancy to realize that Brian was similar to her husband, although he didn't resemble Patrick physically, except for being tall. 
He had the same determined and firm look. However, he also had something hard, cold, and strong about him. I wonder if Joyce also doesn't know him just as I don't know Patrick, Nancy suddenly thought. Or do they have a real family with a warm and trusting relationship? Is everyone here? Brian cheerfully asked. Then let's go to the table. When dinner was nearly finished, Nancy said, everything is delicious. You're a great cook, Joyce. Joyce laughed. Thank you, but it wasn't me. We hired a chef today. Oh, was all Nancy could say. Very convenient, she thought. The idea would never have occurred to her. She was used to doing everything herself, even when she was exhausted. Joyce, on the other hand, didn't seem to like difficulties. The men stood up from the table. We're going to have a smoke and discuss business in the study, said Brian. You girls have fun, Joyce gave him a dazzling smile. Don't worry about us. When the men left, Joyce filled two glasses with pink champagne, almost to the brim. Let's move to the living room, she suggested, handing one glass to Nancy. It'll be easier to monitor the kids from there. The children were happily occupied. Bonnie was expecting a large plush dragon, while Tony was busy stacking multicolored rings on a pyramid. They seemed to be getting along well, Nancy observed with a smile. I hope we can too, Joyce responded. Otherwise, I'm bound to die from boredom here. She raised her glass for a toast. Nancy responded in kind, and they drank. How do you manage living here? The new neighbor continued. I'd go insane in such isolation. I have Bonnie for company. Well, I adore my son, but sometimes I crave adult conversation. And my husband isn't much of a talker, Nancy grinned. She was growing fond of Joyce. Mine neither, she sighed. That's the price to pay for a quiet, nourished, and safe life, Joyce said thoughtfully, her cheeks flushed and her beautiful red curls slightly disheveled. Living in the middle of nowhere, taking care of the house and the baby, keep yourself in shape, be always flawless in front of your husband's partners, pretend you don't know about his mistresses, she continued. All this just to avoid working for a penny like my peers and to be able to afford beautiful clothes and expensive cosmetics. She laughed nervously, and Tony looked at his mother in surprise. It's all right, sweetheart, Joyce reassured him. Mommy's just a bit more relaxed today. Mistresses? Nancy asked. Does Brian cheat on you? Joyce waved her hand dismissively. They all cheat. But you're so beautiful, and so are you. They all choose beautiful partners. They don't settle for less, Joyce said and took another sip from her nearly empty glass. I don't understand, Nancy said. You have a wonderful house, a beautiful son. You're a real model. Why would Brian cheat on you? Joyce looked at her with surprise, as if Nancy had asked about some elementary things. How many dolls does your daughter have, she asked suddenly. I don't know, 15 or 20, I guess. Are they all pretty? Um, yeah, she had no idea what Joyce was trying to tell her. Does your daughter always play with one or different ones? It depends on her mood, but in general, she likes variety. She get bored with one thing quickly. Exactly. Don't you see the truth? She asked. To our husbands, we are just dolls. They were tired of playing with just one. But I'm his wife, not just some girl. We've been together for almost five years, Joyce grinned. And what attracted you to him? What does he know about you other than your beauty? Does he ask you about your dreams? Does he know your favorite book? Does he surprise you with special gifts? Nancy bit her lower lip. Her mind flashing back to the day when she tried on a beautiful dress for prom and Patrick looked at her with a scrutinizing gaze. I don't know, she said quietly. But he chose me to be his wife for some reason, didn't he? Because you're the right fit. It's like buying milk at the store. If it's out of stock, you buy any kind, choosing the best option based on price, quality, and flavor that's available. So you and I are just the right ones at this moment, yes. 
Brian knows that I'm a good wife, that I'm suitable to show off to his rich friends, that I can organize a dinner party, and that I won't pick up my teeth with my fork in a restaurant. He chose me just like he chose his car or the time for his new suit. At that moment, male voices were heard nearby. Joyce perked up. Here come our boys, she said in an entirely different, clear voice. We've been missing you guys. This conversation with the new neighbor lingered in Nancy's mind. She realized that Joyce's thoughts echoed her own suspicions, which she had often brushed aside due to fear. The only thing she didn't want to confront was Patrick's potential infidelity. Although he didn't show her much passion or tenderness, he had been a good husband over the years. He gave her expensive gifts, flowers, never monitored her expenses, was polite to her parents, and even occasionally asked her about her well-being. The thought that Patrick might have another woman or even women disgusted Nancy, so she tried to banish such thoughts from her mind. Meanwhile, communication with Joyce began to improve. She came to visit the next day with Tony. I'm sorry I'm coming so soon, she said. It's just terribly boring at home. Nancy smiled. I'm overjoyed you came. I don't have much to do here either. Bonnie has grown up, and I'm not as busy now as I was the first year after her birth. Oh, said Joyce. Will you show me the house? Sure, Nancy admired the interior. Who designed this? It's perfect. Did you see my place? It's a nightmare. I did it all myself, Nancy confessed. You did it yourself? Joyce was aghast. So you're a designer by education? Nancy smiled wistfully. I have no education. I finished high school, and that summer I married Patrick. That's incredible, Joyce was surprised. Well, I only managed two years in law school, and I can't say that it's been useful. Later, as they sat in the living room drinking tea with homemade cookies, Joyce provided a suggestion. Maybe you could make my house look this cool. Nancy was surprised. You just moved in and renovated it, didn't you? You said it yourself, you had spent so much money. Joyce casually waved her hand. Money isn't a problem. Don't worry about it at all. Brian lets me spend as much as I want. We have to have some fun in this life, don't we? Okay, I'll think about it, replied Nancy. Joyce gently squeezed her hand. I'd really appreciate it. Thus, their visits continued. Nancy couldn't imagine her life without her energetic and cheerful neighbor. They were both in similar situations, but their approaches were different. Nancy felt trapped in a golden cage, with Bonnie being her only escape. Joyce, although in a similar position, made her cage as comfortable as possible and indulged in all available luxuries. Almost every day, Joyce arranged for a car with a private driver for city trips. She started to take Nancy and Bonnie along. Joyce could drive herself, but only when she was in a good mood and not intending to drink, which wasn't often. Thus, for the first time in five years, Nancy began to experience the joys of a luxurious life. They went shopping, buying extravagantly expensive but beautiful items. They dined in restaurants with children's rooms where Bonnie and Tony would spend time. Joyce also introduced her friend to beauticians and masseurs. I see Brian's wife has been a good influence on you, Patrick told her one evening. Why? Nancy asked in surprise. Her husband shrugged and removed his shirt. You seem happier, more cheerful. I like it. I'm going to shower, he left, and Nancy, out of habit, picked up his shirt to put it in the laundry basket. An unfamiliar scent hit her nostrils. It was a feminine perfume, but it wasn't hers. She brought the shirt closer to her nose. It definitely smelled like perfume. No, Nancy thought. I must be imagining things. I shouldn't have sampled so many perfumes at the mall today. Some of the scent must have lingered in my nostrils. She quickly tossed the shirt into the washing machine and started it. This incident was the first time Nancy sensed something was off. After that, she started noticing more things, the faint smell of wine on her husband when he returned late from meeting friends, even though she knew Patrick only drank whiskey with them.
The perfume scent she had once detected was appearing more frequently and couldn't be explained by her visits to the mall. A few times, she noticed long, dark hairs on his jacket. But most significantly, she sensed a change in Patrick's behavior towards her. He had never been affectionate, but now he seemed even more distant. They barely spoke, despite not being in conflict. Sometimes Nancy felt as if he had stopped noticing her, like one might overlook a broken TV gathering dust in a corner. One evening, Patrick was late to work again. She had already put her daughter to bed and went to bed herself, but sleep did not come. We need to talk, thought Nancy, because she couldn't go on like this. However, the prospect of such a conversation didn't please her either. None of the options seemed to promise a good evening. Perhaps Patrick will deny it, saying that I'm imagining things. Then everything will remain the same, except that I will continue to doubt him. Or he'll confess, which is even worse. Then I either endure his cheating for the rest of my life or get a divorce. And where will I go with a little daughter? To my parents in the country? I don't think they would be happy about that. And I, without an education, can hardly find any work to support myself and Bonnie. Is he really saying what I think they're saying? She blurted out. An accident? Asked Patrick. Yes, that would be perfect. I'll give Bonnie to her grandmother to raise. The clinking of glasses sounded again. Nancy became afraid. What if they come out of the office right now? See me? Realize that I heard everything? What will my husband do to me then? Kill me on the spot while our daughter sleeps upstairs? Listen, why don't we go to my place? Brian's voice suddenly sounded. My partner brought me such a whiskey the other day. There are probably only ten bottles of it left in the world. Let's go. Luckily, Nancy hid in the shadow of the stairs just in time, and they didn't notice her. Once the men closed the door behind them, she raced upstairs to her daughter's room. What should I do? Where should I go? Should she call her parents? But how can they help? Nancy bitterly thought. They probably wouldn't believe their beloved son-in-law could do such a thing. Should I call the police? But I don't have any evidence, only an overheard conversation. Should I call Joyce? She's probably asleep by now. But can she help me? What if Brian threatened her too? I need to run, get out of here as quickly as possible. How much time do I have while Patrick and Brian drink their whiskey and plan? An hour or two? Once they finish their drinks, Patrick will have made his decision, and I won't have time to think. If I'm going to run away, it has to be now. There was no time to think. Nancy quickly changed into a t-shirt, jeans, sneakers, and a jacket. The weather was warm, but it was best to dress more securely. She packed the necessary clothes for herself and her daughter into her backpack, along with the jewelry her husband had given her and some cash. Unfortunately, it wasn't much. She didn't take her cards or her phone, knowing Patrick could track them. The most challenging part was getting Bonnie out of bed. Undressed, Mommy, the girl asked sleepily. Don't worry, sunshine, said Nancy, slipping boots onto her feet and buttoning up her jacket. We're just going for a walk. She cradled Bonnie in her arms. The child seemed to have fallen back to sleep. Where to now? We can't go through the settlements. The guards will spot us. There's only one way left, the forest. It starts behind our yard and will shorten the journey to the city. We'll probably have to walk all night, but I'm ready for that. It's warm outside, and the moon is almost full. Large predatory beasts are unlikely to live in the forest this close to human habitation. At least it's better than staying at home with a man who casually discusses my death over a glass of whiskey. Joyce was right. We are just accessories to our husband's things, the suitable things. And when Patrick found someone more suitable, someone who will bear his son, he decided to get rid of the woman that he no longer needed. Nancy didn't know how long she walked through the forest like this. Now, an hour, two, or even more. At first, she didn't feel tired and kept walking without really seeing the path. Bonnie woke up two or three times, looked around in surprise, and almost immediately fell back asleep. 
probably thinks she's dreaming, Nancy thought. I wish it was so. Sometimes, she felt as though all of this was a dream or that she had gone mad in the middle of the night, fleeing home, and now wandering through the woods with a child in her arms. She hoped that after a while, she would see in the distance the light of flashlights, people dressed in reflective vests. They would find her and Bonnie and take them to Patrick. From afar, Nancy would see him crying, and then he would rush to them and hold them tight. He would take his daughter in his arms, shower her with kisses, then kiss Nancy and confess his love for them, saying he couldn't live without them. Did he ever say that he loved me? Nancy suddenly wondered. Or Bonnie. She had already struggled to shuffle her feet and kept trying to remember whether Patrick, at least once in five years of life together, had said that he loves her. Now, it seemed that nothing in the world was more important than that. Fatigue hit her abruptly. She had been walking, but upon spotting a thick fallen tree, she realized she couldn't take another step. Nancy sat on it, adjusting her sleeping daughter comfortably on her lap. That's when she noticed her intense thirst. In her haste, she hadn't thought to bring along even a bottle of water or a pack of Bonnie's favorite cookies. The forest was quiet, devoid of the sounds Nancy anticipated. She thought that she was walking along the highway leading into town. She expected to hear the occasional cars passing by, even at this late hour, but it was eerily silent. Suddenly, Nancy heard a solitary nightbird song and leaves rustling in the trees overhead. She was suddenly seized with fear. Why had she run into the forest at night with her child? Even if she was in danger, Patrick wouldn't likely harm her. At this moment, he would probably arrive home late, drunk, go to bed, and head to work in the morning. This would give Nancy the entire day to think. She could quietly gather their belongings, take Bonnie with her, take a taxi to the city, or ask Joey for a ride. She could withdraw all her money, get a new SIM card the money she had would last for a considerable time. She could move to another city, rent an apartment, and live there with her daughter for a while. Why had she acted so rashly? The answer was clear, she had acted out of fear. Nancy stood up, realizing she was lost, but she had to keep moving. Maybe she was far from the highway, or perhaps there were simply no cars at this hour. Regardless, she couldn't just stand there. How soon would Patrick realize they were gone? Time was her only advantage. The forest was gradually starting to lighten when Nancy spotted the outline of a forest house in the distance. As she approached, she surmised that the house had been vacant for quite some time. In the pre-dawn twilight, the dwelling appeared ancient and gloomy. But none of this mattered to Nancy anymore. All she desired was a bed, a bench, or even just a wooden floor, any flat surface where she could lie down. She moved her legs mechanically, her eyes glazed over, and Bonnie in her arms felt ten times heavier than usual. The backpack straps cut heavily into her shoulders. Nancy tried to open the door, but it was locked. She mustered all her strength and tried again, to no avail. All right, she decided, I'll just rest here. Without even removing her backpack, she sat down on the porch next to the door, held her daughter closer, and closed her eyes. Nancy didn't quite comprehend what transpired next. Whether it was a dream or reality was unclear. She heard a male voice asking something and trying to wake her up. Then she was practically lifted and carried into the house. She held on to Bonnie tightly, fearing to drop her. Then she felt a sudden lightness as someone removed her backpack. The last thing she could vaguely recall was being laid on something soft, with the scent of dry grass. It's called a mitten. A mitten, you wear it on your hand to keep it warm. Not now, of course. It's summer, and you don't need them. But when winter comes, we'll need mittens, the voice was clearly a man's, and an unfamiliar one. Nancy gradually regained consciousness. She realized she was lying, with her eyes closed, in an unknown room, not at home. The bed beneath her was narrow and hard. The events of the previous night slowly started to resurface in her memory. There she was, restlessly tossing and turning in bed, unable to sleep. 
Lights and voices echoed from behind her husband's steady door, the dark forest faintly illuminated by the moonlight flickering through the foliage. Bonnie. Nancy abruptly sat up on the bed and opened her eyes. Finally, your mother is awake too, the same male voice said. Her daughter was sitting on the floor, a large furry brown knitted mitten in her hands, which she was examining. Bonnie noticed her mother watching her and smiled happily. Beside her daughter sat a strange man. He was tall and broad-shouldered, with light red hair, a dark red beard, and green eyes. Are you awake? He asked cheerfully. We've been waiting. Light was streaming through the window. Nancy realized she must have slept for quite some time. What time is it? She asked. Almost 2 p.m., the man replied. Your daughter has been awake for a while. Or is she not a daughter? He furrowed his brow. Daughter, Nancy confirmed. She surveyed her surroundings. They appeared to be inside the house they had sought shelter in the previous day. The walls were made of wooden logs, the furniture was simple, and the entire space was a single room. To the left of the front door were nails on which various large dark jackets hung. It was apparent these belonged to the stranger. Nancy spotted her jacket and her daughter's among them too. To the right was the kitchen, followed by a dining table and chairs, the bed she was currently lying on, and another table with wooden figures scattered on it. Who are you? Nancy asked. The stranger sighed. You are an interesting woman. You arrive at my hut in the middle of the forest with a small child in your arms before sunrise. You faint, sleep for half a day, and when you wake, your first action is to inquire about my identity. And I am just a recluse living my own life. Nancy sighed. I'm sorry. I've had a rough night. I'm Nancy, and this is my daughter Bonnie. My name is Tyler, said the man in a friendly voice. Nice to meet you. Are you a woodsman or something? I just live in the forest. No one appointed me to this role, and I don't receive a salary. Nancy shifted her legs, suddenly aware of aches and pains throughout her body's her neck, back, and shins. She began to massage her neck gently. Do you live in the woods all alone? Tyler smiled and affirmed it with a nod. That's strange, Nancy said quietly to herself. Ha! It's strange, Tyler retorted. Says the woman who ran all night through the forest with a child in her arms. Nancy turned serious. Do you know how long I was walking? It's not difficult to guess. You are, as you might say, deep in the woods. It's at least a two-hour walk from here to any road. Your shoes and the way you passed out on the porch tell me that. By the way, would you like to wash up and eat? Nancy nodded. Let me show you everything, Tyler said, catching her look. We've been playing for hours, and I fed her. Thank you, Nancy replied. She was still confused about where she was and who this man was, but she knew she needed to regain her senses first. There were a few more outbuildings behind the house, a rustic toilet, Tyler pointed out. I hope you know how to use one of these. I do. I grew up in the country, she responded. He glanced at her. Wow, you can't tell, he replied, then continued, that's a summer shower. The water's slightly warm, but you can wash up. For hot water, you'll need to heat the sar. He looked around. I think that's it. Thank you, Nancy replied. When she finished and returned to the house, she saw Bonnie on the bed playing with wooden figures. Nancy worried her daughter might get a splinter, came closer, and picked up one of the toys. Her fears were unfounded, the figures were well polished and had a pleasant scent of fresh wood. Gorgeous, said Nancy, examining the wooden bird with skillfully carved feathers. How long have you been doing this? Three years, shrugged Tyler. Sit down at the table. You need to eat well. Once Nancy ensured her daughter was securely seated and unlikely to fall, she joined Tyler at the table. He served her a large bowl of soup that emitted an appetizing aroma. It appeared to be a mushroom soup with chicken and noodles. I can't eat that much, she protested. Tyler grinned. It only seems so. 
You just start. He placed a wicker bread box on the table filled with flatbread. Is that homemade too? Nancy asked. Everything here is homemade, the house owner replied somewhat indignantly. He was right. Nancy finished the soup and the flatbread. More, he asked. She shook her head, leaning back in her chair. It was just food, but I feel calm for the first time since last night, as if a knot inside me had finally been untied. Thank you, Tyler, she said, looking the man in the eye. I don't know what led me to your house, but I do know that without you, we wouldn't have survived. Oh, come on, who wouldn't help in a situation like this? You should tell me, from whom were you running? What kind of monster made you think it was a good idea to dash through the woods at night with a baby in your arms? Nancy brushed away a tear that had suddenly appeared with her sleeve. My husband. Usually, Nancy was not known for being overly trusting, but now she herself didn't know what was wrong. Whether it was the stress taking a toll, she was just too tired to keep everything bottled up, or the man with kind green eyes sitting across from her inspired such immense trust, she had told him everything, her life story, especially in detail from the moment of the first meeting with Patrick to the moment she fainted on the porch of his forest house. Tyler listened attentively, frowned, sighed, and only occasionally asked clarifying questions. When Nancy finished, he asked, and what was your plan? Survive and then we'll see? Well, you survived the first night relatively well. What's next? I don't know. I suppose we should get to town. Then we can go to my parents' house. Do you think your husband will be looking for you and your daughter? Of course. Where's the first place he's going to go? To my parents, Nancy said and rubbed the bridge of her nose tiredly. I don't know. We'll just need to get lost in the city. Hopefully, considering his money and connections, Nancy realized that Patrick could quickly find them if he wanted to. I see. You can stay here if you like, said Tyler suddenly. Here? Yes. I doubt it would occur to him that you were in the woods with a stranger. Yeah, the woman said and looked intently at Tyler. Why don't you tell me about yourself? Well, I'm just a very normal man. Normal men of your age don't live in the woods. How old do you think I am? Thirty? Thirty-one, I think, Nancy said. You've lived through just as many strange events as I have, he grinned. Let's discuss it later. You need to rest. For the first three days, Nancy and her daughter mostly slept and ate. Nancy was anxious, constantly expecting her husband to walk through the door. Gradually, she began to calm down. It seemed one could get used to anything, even her life transitioning from living in a huge house to a cabin in the woods. Nancy was also surprised by her daughter's calm acceptance. Perhaps Bonnie was too young to comprehend the situation fully, or maybe she was not surprised by her father's absence, as she saw him rarely despite not living in the village for many years. Nancy found it easy to adapt to this lifestyle. She was continually amazed at how Tyler managed to live comfortably in the simple forest house, seemingly needing little. She was particularly curious about the source of drinking water. The river, the master of the house explained. I have a water pipe running from there. We are drinking river water? Nancy asked in horror. Don't take me for a lunatic, Tyler took offense. See that SHF? There is an automatic filtration station inside. It's all safe. Tyler also maintained a vegetable garden, growing almost all the vegetables and berries that the climate allowed. He bought meat in the city and stored it in the basement. Out of curiosity, Nancy ventured down there and found it to be as cold as a large freezer even in summer. There's also additional room, Tyler said, where I store all sorts of pickles and jams. Wow, what do you buy besides meat? Nancy asked. Cereal, pasta, flour, occasionally canned goods, vitamins, and so on, he replied. And how do you get to the city? Tyler gestured vaguely to the side. There's a barely visible path that starts just a bit further down. If you don't know it's there, you won't see it. Follow it for two hours, and you'll reach the village. 
I have an arrangement with one of the locals who keeps my car in his garage. I use it to get to the city. So you have to carry what you buy for two hours? Why not? I'm healthy, and exercise is good for me. I also get meat, milk, eggs, sour cream, and cottage cheese from the locals. How often do you go out? I limit my trips to once every two or three months. In the winter, I stay here all the time. There's no pleasure in walking for two hours in the cold, especially with a load. In the summer, I visit the village more often, maybe even once a week. How do you keep yourself entertained, especially in the winter? Tyler smiled. Well, you saw, I make figurines out of wood. You're about to be very surprised, but we have internet here. Internet? Yes. No civilization can hide from it. Look at what I'm about to show you. He pulled out a laptop, a cell phone, and a tablet from the closet. Although Nancy wasn't particularly tech savvy, she recognized the devices from what her husband used and had a rough idea of how much they cost. The devices Tyler was showing her were clearly not cheap. The image of the mysterious forest hermit was getting more intriguing. He clearly has, or at least had, a lot of money, thought Nancy. Who is he hiding from? From criminal friends? She resolved to find out. Despite the kindness Tyler had shown her and Bonnie, she would feel more at ease knowing more about him. Gradually, Nancy found herself taking on a share of the daily chores. She cooked, washed dishes, cleaned the house, watered the vegetable garden, and did laundry. After a while, she realized they were living like a real family. You work very hard, Tyler, who had just returned from another trip to the village, told Nancy with a frown. Nancy was outside hanging laundry while Bonnie played with wooden figurines nearby. Bonnie had grown fond of them, and Tyler carved her a new one every few days. Actually, we're living at your place, Nancy responded. We have housing, food, entertainment, thanks to you. Entertainment, Tyler snorted. Your tablet has an excellent library. I've never read so much and with such pleasure, Nancy admitted. I'm glad you found an interesting occupation in this wilderness, Tyler said. And don't worry about money and other things. Even if a hundred more mothers with children came to me, I could provide and feed them all. Really? Nancy asked. I knew you were rich. Tyler frowned as if he had said something unnecessary. You're not poor either. My husband is not poor, Nancy corrected him, sighing. Tyler looked at her strangely. Let's sit on the porch tonight after Bonnie falls asleep. You'll see how beautiful the evening is in the forest, Nancy thought for a moment. I saw some homemade liquor in your cellar. I can't hide anything from you, Nancy wasn't a fan of drinking, but she decided that the liquor would be her ally today, helping her get Tyler to open up. In the evening, once Bonnie was asleep, they quietly slipped outside and sat on the porch, staring silently into the distance. Initially, Nancy couldn't make sense of anything. Then she began to notice the fading colors of the day, the shifting shadows, and the gradual silencing of the daytime sounds of birds and insects. She became aware of the night sounds growing more audible. It's beautiful, Nancy remarked quietly. Yes, Tyler replied in an equally soft tone. I've seen it countless times, but I never tire of it. Nancy smiled, stealing a glance at him. At first, he had seemed strange to her, an unkempt, towering, burly forester with a thick red beard and a grim sense of humor. But the more they interacted, the more she realized how deep and sensitive Tyler was. He seemed well-educated and clearly knew more than he let on. Nancy took out the glasses she had brought from the kitchen and poured a little bit of peach liqueur into each. A fruity aroma filled the air. To our strange acquaintance, said Nancy, holding out a glass to Tyler. He smiled, took the glass, and clinked it lightly with Nancy's. To our strange acquaintance. The drink was moderately sweet but potent. Nancy took a small sip and tried not to grimace. Very tasty, she said. Tyler nodded. So, let me clarify, your plan was to get me drunk and uncover my terrible past, wasn't it? Yes, Nancy admitted with a shy smile. 
Fine, I'll tell you, Tyler sighed and ruffled his hair. How does he cut his hair? Nancy suddenly wondered. Does he go to the city or do it himself? You guessed right, Tyler began. I come from a wealthy family. Nancy smiled. A very wealthy family, he added, grimacing as if the fact were unpleasant. And I'm not from around here. I was born on the other side of the country. Wow, Nancy said. Yes, and my family was one of the most influential in that city. Is that related to crime? Nancy asked. You guessed well, Tyler replied. Well, that would explain a lot, the man said. Long story short, yes, my father is a serious criminal mastermind, and a few other close relatives are two uncles, cousins, you name it. Have you always known about this? Nancy asked. Not exactly, he replied. When I was young, my mom would tell me and my brother that my dad was just away on business. Wait, you have a brother? Older or younger? I had a brother. He was older than me, but only by an hour. We are twins. Nancy frowned, but didn't say anything. He continued, as teenagers, we began to understand our family's business, what our father, uncles, and older cousins were involved in. I was horrified, but my brother enjoyed it in a way. I was fortunate, since he was technically older, my father saw my brother as his successor. I wasn't initially attracted to the family business. When we came of age, my father began to teach us his business. As time went on, my brother became more involved in all of this. I increasingly felt the need to remove him from the situation and escape together. Despite my attempts to persuade him, he wouldn't listen. He spoke of the inevitability of evil and that we had to keep control and that if we didn't, others would come along who would be worse. Then he was gone, he concluded. I'm very sorry for your loss, Nancy said. It wasn't unexpected. Something like this was bound to occur at some point. When he passed away, my father and I went to see him. I looked at his face, and it reminded me of his youthful expression from our childhood. It was like staring at the young boy I'd known my whole life who was always there for me. But now he was gone forever. How did you get over it? Nancy asked. I don't know if I did. It was also hard for my parents. My father appeared devastated. He then told me I had to fill my elder brother's shoes. Oh my goodness, Nancy said. That's when I left. You see me now in a more or less sane state, but then I just wanted to hide from the world. Did it work? Yes, until you started knocking on my door early one summer morning, Nancy laughed. Well, I'm sorry. I'm overjoyed things turned out the way they did. I haven't felt so charmed and alive in years, she said. Me too, said Nancy, suddenly changing the topic. I need to go to town. I want to contact my parents and assure them I'm okay. They must be worried. Okay, we'll go. Could someone from your village drive me to town? I'd like you to stay with Bonnie again, he frowned. Of course not. We had a great time last time. Bonnie turned her gaze to Tyler and smiled at him, showing her small white teeth. The man smiled back and playfully tickled her. Bonnie laughed so freely that Nancy felt a wave of warmth. I'm worried about you, Tyler said. You've been lucky once, but what if your father or friend have already told everything to Patrick? It could be a trap. They wouldn't do that. Okay, just be careful. They met Joyce at a small, inconspicuous cafe on the outskirts of town. Her friend's expensive clothes made her stand out significantly. Thankfully, there were hardly any customers at this time of day. Darling, Joyce exclaimed, pulling her friend tightly against her. I'm so happy to see you. Nancy, replied Nancy, as they sat down at the table. Nancy noticed that Joyce was trying to discreetly wipe away her tears. Why are you so moved? Nancy asked in surprise. I thought you had died. Joyce admitted, yes, I'm alive, Nancy confirmed. I've already imagined the worst, said Joyce. What happened? Can we meet? Do you need help? 
Money? Nancy smiled, appreciating Joyce's concern. They arranged to meet in a week. Nancy herself didn't know how the meeting with Joyce would help. She just realized she wanted to see her friend. Although she and Bonnie were safe with Tyler for now, she knew it couldn't last forever. She thought about this a lot. The only option seemed to be to run away so far that her husband wouldn't find her and her daughter. But was that even possible? Nevertheless, she needed money for that. All her reflections led to the conclusion that it was best to stay here with Tyler as long as possible. Nancy didn't want to admit it, but she desired to stay for other reasons as well. She began to realize the vast differences between Patrick and Tyler, and, most importantly, how different her feelings were for these two men. Patrick had always been a stranger to her. Looking at him, she wondered what he was thinking, what emotions he had. Tyler was entirely different. His warmth was palpable, she could feel it with every fiber of her being. Bonnie understood this as well, she trusted him easily from day one. Nancy also trusted him unconditionally and did not want to leave him. Are you going to the city again? Tyler asked with concern when Nancy told him her plans. I want to talk to my friend. She might give some advice. Would you mind looking after Bonnie again? He frowned. Of course not. We had a great time last time. Bonnie turned her gaze to Tyler and smiled at him, showing her small white teeth. The man smiled back and playfully tickled her. Bonnie laughed so freely that Nancy felt a wave of warmth. I'm worried about you, Tyler said. You've been lucky once, but what if your father or friend have already told everything to Patrick? It could be a trap. They wouldn't do that. Okay, just be careful. They met Joyce at a small inconspicuous cafe on the outskirts of town. Her friend's expensive clothes made her stand out significantly. Thankfully, there were hardly any customers at this time of day. Darling, Joyce exclaimed, pulling her friend tightly against her. I'm so happy to see you, Nancy replied as they sat down at the table. Nancy noticed that Joyce was trying to discreetly wipe away her tears. Why are you so moved? Nancy asked in surprise. I thought you had died, Joyce admitted. Why did you think so? Her friend looked up at Nancy. We had a conversation with Brian the night you and Bonnie disappeared. Nancy froze. Tell me, she said. Joyce started to crumple a paper napkin, her hands shaking. Late one night when my son and I were asleep, Brian and your husband came in. They sat downstairs quietly at first. Then their laughter grew louder as they discussed something I couldn't hear. Their conversation, I wish I had. It lasted until morning. I hadn't slept much and I had a headache. I lost my temper and confronted my husband. I told him we had a small child and I wouldn't tolerate such behavior in our home. Joyce paused, looking up at her friend with her large blue eyes. Then Brian grabbed my throat and pinned me against the wall, she continued. He told me I was lucky. He said, your best friend is about to leave for the other world, and I'm tolerating you for now. Nancy shivered, feeling a tremor run through her. Joyce exhaled sharply. You can't imagine how scared I was, then she said. I hoped it was a drunken joke. I wanted to call you, but I couldn't. Brian was next to me, and then Patrick called him and told him that you were missing. I didn't know what to think. Of course, I wanted to hope that you somehow found out about everything and you ran away, but I also couldn't stop thinking that Patrick had done something to you. Joyce began to cry. It's all right, Nancy said firmly. I managed to find out about my husband's plans. We ran away. A good man took us in. We are safe. I don't know what to do next though. Joyce calmed down, raised her head to say something, and suddenly gasped. Oh no, he's been following me. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Nancy looked back. Brian and Patrick were approaching them. She began to think quickly, even surprising herself. Run, Nancy, she shouted, grabbing her friend's hand. Through the second door, quickly. Joyce snapped out of her daze and ran with Nancy towards the exit opposite the one their husbands had just entered. 
They sprinted inside and jumped into Joyce's car. We have to get them off our backs, the woman exclaimed. Nancy spotted Brian and Patrick sprinting towards their own car. Where are we going? She asked in terror. We'll leave the city via the highway, Joyce answered confidently. Then we'll lose them and figure out our next steps. We just need to buy some time. They drove surprisingly fast, but Nancy noticed they were being followed by a car driven by Brian. Brian seldom drives himself, Joyce noted, and I've taken extreme driving courses before. We can outrun them. Nancy desperately wanted to believe this. She was terrified of what Patrick might do if they were caught. Would he kill her on the spot? Kidnap her and lock her in a basement? Would he find out where Bonnie was and hurt Tyler too? She gripped the seatbelt so tightly it would leave marks on her hands. Joyce was recklessly driving on the highway, overtaking, cutting off, and even using the oncoming lane. Despite the initial caution, Brian began to follow suit when he realized they were falling behind. In the first moment, Nancy could barely comprehend what was happening. She saw a massive truck slowing down in the rearview mirror, and something seemed to change in the line of vehicles. Oh my God, Joyce exclaimed in horror, pulling over and stopping. Two weeks after the funeral, as Nancy was packing her belongings, there was a knock at the door. Come in, she called out. As expected, it was Joyce and Tony. Nancy and her friend hadn't seen much of each other in the past two weeks. There was too much to handle. Almost packed already? Yes, replied Nancy. I mostly took personal items and things that Bonnie liked. Are you sure you're going to give up the inheritance? Patrick had parents and a brother. They can inherit everything. But Bonnie is still his daughter, Joyce said. Nancy grinned. He never considered her his heiress. We don't need his money. Joyce smiled. But I won't give up mine. Tony and I need it. Nancy came closer and took her hand. Of course, you shouldn't refuse Brian's inheritance, especially after what you've told me about Brian all these years. Joyce looked away. I want to forget it as soon as possible. Nancy hugged her. They stood like that for a few seconds, then broke the embrace. Are you going to live in this house? Nancy asked. Joyce wrinkled her nose and shook her head. I grew to hate it during the short time I lived here. I'm now looking for a suitable apartment in the city. Once my son and I move in, I'll put this house on the market. Although with the expensive luxury finish, it's unlikely to sell quickly. Nancy laughed. Promise me you'll become an interior designer, Joyce said. You have a talent for it, and someday you'll furnish my new house. You'll have to wait a long time. I'm in no hurry. Okay, Nancy promised with a laugh. I should have gone to school a long time ago. Tyler won't be able to take care of Bonnie and me for the rest of his life. Actually, he can, Joyce reasonably noted, and it seems like he even wants to. But you're right, learning independence is important. I'm thinking of returning to my university too. At that moment, a car honked in the street. Your Mr. Wright has arrived, Joyce remarked. Nancy blushed. He's not mine, she replied, but Joyce only smiled in response. It's strange to think that we won't be living in the forest, Nancy said thoughtfully, sitting in a car. She glanced at her daughter, peacefully sleeping in the back seat. I think we'll be more comfortable in a normal house, Tyler said with a smile. Are you ready? Nancy asked cautiously. The man momentarily glanced away from the road, met her eyes, and nodded. I am. I now think that maybe I stayed in that forest so long because I was waiting for you to come to me. Nancy smiled. I'm happy that you've waited. Me too, said Nancy, suddenly. And then changed the topic. Thank you for joining us today on Deep Stories. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next video.